We are in the middle of a series called Thriving in Babylon. We're doing a deep dive into the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. And throughout this series, we've been asking the question, how do you live in a culture that's constantly trying to undermine your faith and your values? And Daniel finds himself a prisoner in a pagan empire. And he's facing this immense pressure to bow to their God, to bow to their king, to their way of life. And yet he never does. And I think it's a story for our time and for our place. And so before we dig into Daniel chapter 5, I think it's important that we have a little background to understand what's happening there. Now, from Daniel chapter 1 to Daniel chapter 5, about 50 years of time has passed. Remember in Daniel chapter 1, Daniel is a teenager and he's taken by King Nebuchadnezzar to serve in his court in Babylon. But by chapter 5, he's now a man in his 70s, all right? He has lived for over five decades in exile in Babylon. Uh, king Nebuchadnezzar is long dead and gone, and there is a new king on the throne. And the text is going to refer to him as Nebuchadnezzar's son, but he was not his son biologically. In fact, the word there can mean just successor. But in that ancient culture, uh, someone who was in succession to a famous king would often call themselves the son of that king, even if that was not the case biologically. What we know from archaeology, what we know from history of that time period, records outside the Bible is that Belshazzar was not the biological son of King Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, there were four kings in between Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. Belshazzar's father, Nabonidus, came to the throne by assassinating his predecessor. And so while Nabonidus did marry a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, he was not a biological descendant. So the point is that Neb Belshazzar is referred to as the son of Nebuchadnezzar only in the symbolic political sense. In other words, it was the way of legitimizing a throne by referring to the continuity of the royal lineage. Now, something else that's very important to know here is that Nabonidus, the father of Belshazzar, didn't like sitting on the throne of Babylon. He was an adventurer, and he was hardly ever in the city of Babylon. We know this from history, that he would go out uh, with the army fighting battle, battles and doing things on the frontier. So what Nabonidus does is he makes his son, Belshazzar, the regent of Babylon. Which is why later on in Daniel chapter 5, when Belshazzar offers Daniel third in line to the royal throne, it's because he can't give him number two. He's number two. <laughs> and so he offers him number three. Nabonidus is the king, but he's off fighting battles. And so Belshazzar, his son, second in command, is ruling in Babylon in his place. Now, something else is very important to know. Uh, historical background is that the Persian army is camped outside the city of Babylon. They have been camped outside the city for several months. Everyone knows that they're there, this powerful Persian army. And there's another piece of information that's very important here, and that is that Daniel is a forgotten man. You remember under the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel had become an important advisor to the king, maybe the most important advisor to the king. But after several kings, he's been shelved. He's been pushed aside. He's been forgotten. So that's the context for chapter 5. Belshazzar knows the Persian army, this formidable army, is right outside the walls of the city. All he has to do is walk up to the walls, and he can see the army that's camped there. Meanwhile, his father is off with the army somewhere else. Now, at the same time, he's not too worried because everyone considered Babylon to be an impregnable city. In fact, even secular historians agree to that. The city, the city was huge. I'm not exaggerating. The city, 300, the walls were 300 feet tall and 80 feet wide. That's why you wouldn't go over the walls and you weren't going through the walls. And then add to the fact that Euphrates River ran through the center of the city of Babylon. So you had plenty of water. It was such a huge city. There were plenty of gardens, plenty of places to grow crops. So you had Walls that you couldn't go over or through. You had a boundless water supply. You had plenty of food. Basically, all you had to do, all, 
all he had to do, Belshazzar, was wait out the Persian army or wait for his father to return home with his army. Now, the Persian army is, however, very formidable. Everyone's talking about it. People are getting nervous, and so Belshazzar thinks in his mind, I need to boost the morale of my citizens, especially of those who are in high places, of the bigwigs. So how do you do that? How do you boost morale when you're surrounded by a big army? Well, he thinks uh, you throw a wild party with lots of food and lots of booze. Notice verse 1 of chapter 5. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Now, understand, this is not a a nice sit-down steak dinner with a glass of Merlot. (laughs) That's not what's happening here. This is a strap your boots on. We're about to tie one on and forget what's happening outside the walls of this city. And as a result, Belshazzar makes the dumbest booze-induced decision of booze-induced decisions that have ever been made, all right? He decides to turn the party into a kind of drunken worship service that pays homage to the gods of Babylon. So I want you to notice how he does it in verse 2 through verse 4 of chapter 5. It says, while Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles and his wives and his concubines drank from them. And as they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Now you see what's going on here. This, this is not some stupid paternity prank. This is a deliberate act of blasphemy. And remember, the Persian army is camped out around the city, and no matter how impregnable you think your city might be, people are still getting nervous. And so Belshazzar thinks they need to be reminded how powerful our gods are. Our gods are bigger and better than the gods of the Persian army. And so I've got an idea to remind them how powerful our gods are. Let's remind them of the gods that we've conquered in the past. And so he says to some of his guys, hey, I want you to come here. I want you to go get those sacred goblets that we took from the temple of that Jewish God. So they get the sacred goblets. They fill them with wine. And they start paying homage to their gods by mocking the God of the Jews. And the more they drink, the more they mock. It becomes this kind of wild free-for-all. But you probably know the story. God is about to crash their party. (laughs) And Belshazzar is going to sober up more quickly than any man in history has ever sobered up. All right? Let's look at verse 5 and verse 6. Suddenly, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak, and his knees were knocking. No doubt, right? You know, when I was reading this, I was reminded of Don Meredith. How many of you remember Don Meredith, former pro football quarterback, became announcer. He was with Howard Cosell. And I always remember we'd watch the games. Whenever the game got lopsided and it was nearly over, then Don Meredith would, would sing that, Turn out the lights, the party's over. Excuse the singing. That's what, that's what he would sing, right? <laughs> the party's over. And of course, here in the text, now for the third time in the book of Daniel, the king of Babylon is going to call his astrologers here, his enchanters, his diviners, to help him make sense of what's going on. And of course, for the third time, they hadn't got a clue. (laughs) Don't miss what the writer, by the way, is trying to tell us here. You won't find truth by turning to the occult. By looking to the stars... By consulting your horoscope for guidance, by going to psychics for answers. I know some Christians even do it. They think it's harmless entertainment. Listen, it's really blasphemous. It's turning to the father of lies for truth. 
and he will only take you farther from the truth. It didn't work then, and it's not going to work now. Don't miss what he's trying to say here. But he says there is somebody in Babylon who receives wisdom from God, but they've been forgotten, they've been shelved, but there's one lady, there's one woman who remembers him. She's referred to as queen, by the way, some debate among scholars, whether that's Belshazzar's wife or whether it's the queen mother, his mother. But she goes in and she sees this, this court where everybody is freaking out over the handwriting on the wall. And I want you to notice what she says beginning in verse 10. And let's read through verse 17. The queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet hall. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought before the king and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father, the king brought from Judah? I've heard that the spirit of, of the gods is in you and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and the enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now, I have heard that you're able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you'll be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, you may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and I will tell you what it means. <laughs> now for a moment, imagine that you're Daniel and you were once the respected advisor to the king, maybe the most respected, but you've been abandoned, you've been forgotten, you have been shelved and suddenly there's a knock on the door. Get dressed. The king wants to see you and you're escorted into the court of this drunken king and his drunken court and they are holding the sacred goblets of God taken from the temple and you know exactly what is happening and they're asking you for your help again. Now one of the questions that might occur to you is how is Daniel not bitter or exasperated? How is he just not so, I'm over this. I think for two reasons. Number one is he expects Babylon to be Babylon. He's living in a polytheistic culture, in a culture where they worship many gods, and he's not surprised. Babylon is going to be Babylon. It's a society that, for the most part, doesn't share his values as a follower of God. That's why I get, sometimes I have to laugh at Christians who are surprised in our culture that people who are not followers of Christ do the things that they do. He expected Babylon to be Babylon. But second, every time Daniel is called on, he seems to believe that I am where I am and when I am for a reason. That God has a purpose for me being here. And so, once again, Daniel serves God in Babylon and Daniel serves Babylon for God he enters into the room and Belshazzar says, hey, you interpret this handwriting on the wall. I'll, I'll clothe you in fine clothes. I will make you rich. I'll make you third in line to the king. Again, why third in line to the king? Because he was second, right? He couldn't give third in line. In. And Daniel kind of says, you keep it. I, I don't need it. <laughs> it's kind of like being offered a leadership position on the Titanic. Yeah. No, thank you, right? It's, it's going down the party. I mean, along with the Babylonian Empire is about to end and Daniel is there to literally read the writing on the wall. And he does. Here's what the writing on the wall means. Look at verse 26 and 28. Here's what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. As you probably know, this is from this story is where we even get the phrase, you read the handwriting on the wall. 
you know, where we get the, the idea that your days are numbered. The co- courage of Daniel is amazing. He's facing a king and a thousand nobles, and he tells them, your days are numbered. And they were. They were. Historians tell us exactly how the Persians took this seemingly impenetrable city of the Babylonians. And so what the Persians did is they built some canals miles away from the city and they diverted the water enough so that the water level would go down and the Persian army could literally walk under the walls into the city. And they took it without very many casualties at all, except for a few, one of them being, guess who? That very night, Belshazzar was slain, and Darius the Mede took over his kingdom at the age of 62. As I was reading this, one of the things that I found very interesting is that for the first four chapters, you remember God gave Nebuchadnezzar, a king who was very uh, braggart, rebellious, full of himself, He gave him chance after chance after chance to come to his senses, right? And he finally did. We saw that last week in chapter 4, which leads to this question. Where's the second chance for Belshazzar? Why didn't he get a second chance? Well, the answer is he did. You see, Belshazzar, unlike Nebuchadnezzar, didn't have an ignorance problem. He had an obedience problem. When he sent For those goblets and vessels taken from the temple, he knew exactly the God that he was messing with. In fact, Daniel even tells him so. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 through verse 24. Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor because of the high position he gave him. All the nations and people of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms of the earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, You have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you and your nobles and your wives and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold and bronze and iron and wood and stone, which cannot see or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all of your ways. Wow. Daniel is saying to Belshazzar, you knew the God you were messing with. Your father sent a letter to the entire kingdom. Everybody read it. It was front page news. Everyone knows what happened. In fact, everybody still talks about those seven years when your father was humbled and he he was like a wild beast in the field. Everybody knows about the God of the Hebrews that he gave glory and honor to his judges. Belshazzar doesn't have an ignorance problem. He has an obedience problem. He takes the objects from the temple of God, the golden vessels which are sacred and holy to God and he treats them with disrespect and contempt and he knew better here's my question could we ever be guilty of that could we ever be guilty of taking what is holy and sacred to God and treating it with contempt or disrespect and I'd suggest that for most of us here this morning we we cannot plead ignorance so here's the truth One of the key takeaways from this passage I hope you take with you, and that is that Babylon doesn't respect the holy things of God. Babylon does not respect the holy things of God. In Babylon, truth is relative. In Babylon, the truth is always in flux. Truth changes according to the culture, according to the political climate. What is true today in Babylon may not be true tomorrow. There's a preacher by the name of Will Williamson tells a story about how early in his ministry he served in a little church in rural Georgia and one Sunday he and his wife 
went to a funeral that was held at another little church nearby. And he said it was like no funeral he had ever been to. Will said the casket was open. And the, the whole funeral consisted of a, ser- a sermon given by their preacher. He said the preacher pounded the pulpit and he looked over at the casket and he said these words, it's too late for Joe. He might have wanted to get his life together. He might have wanted to spend more time with his family. He might have wanted to do that, but he's dead now. It's too late for him, but it's not too late for you. There is still time for you. You can still decide you are alive. It's not too late for you. Today is the day of decision. And then the preacher told the story about how a Greyhound bus had run into a funeral procession on the way to the cemetery one time and how that that could happen today. And he said, you should decide today. Today is the day to get your life together. It's too late for old Joe, but it's not too late for you. Will said that when he left that funeral, he was was angry, angry at that preacher. And he said on the way home, he and his wife got in the car, and he said to his wife, have you ever seen anything as manipulative and insensitive to that poor family? He said, I found it disgusting. And his wife said, I know, I've never heard anything like that. It was a manipulative and disgusting and insensitive. And worst of all, everything he said was true. (laughs) See, Babylon does not respect the holy things of God. Babylon does not respect the truth. But truth is going to be validated one day. And listen. I know, and we've talked about this, there are some things in the Bible that are hard to understand, but there are also some things that God's made very clear that are sacred, holy things to God. One of them is the value of life. God is the author of life. Human beings are made in his image. Life is holy and sacred to God. Life in the womb, life in a prison cell, life that doesn't think like you, like life that doesn't look like you or vote like you. All life is sacred, but Babylon doesn't believe that. Babylon doesn't treat all life as being sacred, but God does. Another one that God holds sacred and holy is marriage. Marriage is holy and sacred to God. He made it very clear at the beginning of the Bible. He designed marriage. He made it very clear that it is to be monogamous, It is to be heterosexual. It is to be permanent. And sex only belongs in marriage. Jesus came along and he validated that truth very, very clearly. But Babylon, Babylon comes along and says, you know, we no longer believe that, that you have to get married to have sex. That is repressive and barbaric. Marriage is not permanent. People drift apart. Love comes and goes. And this backward notion that marriage is between a man and a woman, you guys are so out of touch. Babylon believes that you can take that sacred thing of God and do anything you want to with it. But here's what God's word says. The Bible says, Hebrews 13, 4, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. In other words, be careful what you do with marriage because it matters to God. By the way, so does your body. In 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19, Paul says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. If you are a Christian, your body belongs to the Holy Spirit. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit that belongs to God. If you abuse your body by the way that you live, by the lifestyle that you lead, by how you steward your sexuality, you're profaning what is sacred and holy to God. You're handling something that is holy and sacred in the wrong way. No Christian can ever say, it's my body and I'll do with it whatever I like. See, You are not your own. That's not a political statement. That's a biblical statement. Your body doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. Another thing that's holy to God is his name. God considers his name to be holy and sacred. He's very clear about that. Babylon will always treat the name of God with with disdain. You know, we live in an OMG culture, right? Always using the name of God like that. And let me say, if, if you want to act surprised about something, 
Use somebody else's name. Use my name if you want to do it. All right, use Kyle's name. He, he, he probably wouldn't mind. But don't use the name of God. His name is holy. He's clear that his name is to be considered sacred and holy. He's clear, honor my name. Here's the thing. If you live in Babylon, Babylon's going to try to get you to party with the sacred things of God. Babylon is going to try to get you to take what is holy and sacred to God and party with it. But remember this, God's going to crash the party. <laughs> and the truth is going to win out someday. Babylon is not going to last, but the word of God will last. It always lasts. His truth always lasts. And I want to close by challenging you to remember this very important truth that we're taught from this passage. And that is that faithfulness will be recognized. Faithfulness will be recognized. Babylon always picks the wrong heroes. Always. Daniel understood that true honor is not determined by kings or people in high places. True honor is determined by God. Babylon may forget about you. Babylon may shelve you. Babylon may dismiss you. So don't ever switch teams. Don't fall for Babylon's party. Don't trade what is temporary for what is eternal? Or what's eternal for what's temporary, I should say. Bill Broadhurst was running a race in Omaha, Nebraska. It was a 10K race, which is 6.2 miles. Now, what was really unique about Bill? It, number one, he's a Christian. That wasn't really unique. But what was unique about him running this 10K is that when he was a young man, he suffered a brain aneurysm, leaving him partially paralyzed on his left side. But he had decided he wanted to run this 10K race despite the obstacle. One of the reasons was his hero, Bill Rogers, was in the race that day. Rogers is an incredible runner. He ran the race, won the race, ran it in 29 minutes and 37 seconds. And the other, the other runners finished from anywhere from 30 minutes to 50 minutes. The joggers, you know, from 60 to 70 minutes. But it was going to take Bill a whole lot longer. And as he ran, he writes, some of the kids didn't understand that he was competing. And they said, hey, mister, you missed a good race. He says, as he's running, his left side that, you know, was, was partially paralyzed. He said, it got so numb, he wanted to quit. He wanted to drop out. He said, after two hours, the cars were back on the streets. And it was starting to get dark because it was Saturday afternoon. And running through the intersections became very difficult. He said one policeman at one point stopped traffic to let him through the intersection. Another nice lady offered him some water. But two hours and 20 minutes later, he said the pain was so bad. It was throbbing so bad. He said, I didn't, want, didn't know if I could make it. Didn't want to go on. And then he saw the end. They had taken the banner down. Broadhurst, he ran down the sidewalk. The banner was gone. His heart sank because he thought everybody had forgotten him. Everybody had left. He thought, what's the use? But he decided to finish. And when he got to the end, out of the alleyway stepped Bill Rogers and a gang of other people. And they were waiting for him. Rogers opened his arms, welcome, welcomed him as he ran across the finish line and hugged him. And after Broadhurst, you know, after he had willed his partly paralyzed body across that finish line, Rogers took the gold medal from around his neck and put it around the neck of his friend. And he said, Broadhurst, you're the winner. Take the gold. See, Babylon will forget you and shelve you and dismiss you, but God never will. He says, here's the crown. Here's the crown. Take it. You see, here's the thing. Babylon is going to fall again. God has warned the world that judgment is coming. And you will either be judged by Christ or you will be judged in Christ. Romans 8 and verse 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You see, without Christ Jesus, you've been weighed and found wanting. The Bible says that all of us are broken. None of us can stand before a holy God and proclaim our righteousness. Not morally, not intellectually, not doctrinally. 
None of us have the righteousness of God. But Jesus takes his righteousness and he gives it to us. He says, you're the winner. Take the crown. That's why the Bible says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And Paul would write in Galatians 3.27, and all who have been united, get this, all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ. If been, you've been united with him in baptism, you've put on Christ. See, Babylon's going to fall, but I'm not afraid because God's kingdom will never end. God's kingdom is eternal. Let me ask you, are you a part of that kingdom? Have you bowed your knee to the Lord and confessed your sins, confessed your belief that Jesus is the Son of God, been baptized into him and put on Christ so that you have his righteousness? If not, I plead with you, do that today. Do that today. If you're a child of God and you've been living like Babylon, you've been giving into the culture, to the truths of the culture and not staying true to the truths of God, will you, where you sit today, repent of that. Say, God, Babylon's going to end. I want to live for you and your truths in your kingdom. If you need to pray with one of our elders in just a moment, they'll be at the back to pray with you. They'd love to do that. If you're watching online, let us know if you have any prayer requests. We'd love to pray for you.